Perfect. Well, let's go ahead and dive right in. Again, I appreciate you all taking the time out of your day to be here. I know that it's a very, very busy season of life, um, so I really appreciate it. Today, we're gonna be talking about the USDA SBIR program. But first, I like to go over just a few housekeeping things before we dive in. Um, so first, please do make sure that you stay on mute so that we don't get any feedback and we can hear our speakers clearly. Um, second, be mindful of your video. Um, I did go ahead and just do a regular Teams meeting for this because we have a small crowd and I thought uh, we could have some discussion, um, but please do make sure that you're mindful of your video. Um, preferably don't stand up, just turn your, turn your camera off if you need to stand up. Um, list any questions that you have in the chat because we will be saving all questions until the end so that we can bounce ideas off each other and have a, a discussion. Um, and this session is being recorded, like I said, so again, make sure that you're mindful of your camera. Um, and you will be receiving an email with resources and slides next week and the recording of the session today. Uh, the session will also be posted on the Indiana SPDC YouTube page. So let's go ahead and dive in here. Just a quick overview of our agenda. Uh, we're going to start with a quick welcome from myself and Andrew Carty from Indiana State Department of Agriculture. Then I will turn it over to the folks at USDA to give an overview of their SBIR program. Then we're going to have a speaker from Elevate Ventures come to talk about the Indiana SBIR support resources that are available to you as Hoosier small business owners and entrepreneurs. And then we've left about 30 minutes for questions. Um, we don't need to utilize the entire 30 minutes um, if, we, if we don't have enough questions to fill the time, but I just wanted to give you all the opportunity to engage with our experts that we'll have on the call um, to address any questions or concerns. So first, uh, welcome. My name is Morgan Allen. I am the Small Business Program Manager for the Indiana Small Business Development Center, or SBDC, that is part of the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. So I am a, a state employee um, dedicated to the, the small business division of the, the economic uh, development of Indiana. My contact information is on this slide um, and that I'll also be the one sending the follow up email. So if you have any questions, you are welcome to reach out to me directly. Uh, and I'm sure the speakers that uh, will be joining us today would be more than happy to address your questions as well. I did just want to give a quick overview of who the Indiana SPDC is and what we do. And please do make sure that you're staying on mute. So I'm not getting any feedback. As much as I love hearing myself talk, don't want to hear it twice. Uh, so the Indiana Small Business Development Center is funded in part by the US Small Business Administration. So the ones that were making the, the PPP loans idle, um, that might, might spark some memory for you and the state of Indiana, like I said, um, I'm a state employee. But we exist to assist Hoosier small businesses and entrepreneurs. Um, so there is a small business development center in every single US state and territory. Um, so if you're joining us from outside of Indiana today, you do have a local SBDC that you can contact as well to access some of these resources. Uh, and I see a question, will the slide presentations be emailed after this meeting? Uh, yes, yes, they will, and so will a recording. Um, last year, we assisted 5,411 Hoosier small businesses and entrepreneurs. Um, we are really, really excited to be able to, to step up in a really difficult year um, and help people um, survive and thrive uh, during COVID-19. But what we do is offer no-cost and confidential small business advising and training um, this is a, a brief overview of the services we offer. Um, what we like to say is last year we saw 5,411 businesses and we helped solve or work on 5,411 problems. So really any challenge that you're facing, we exist to help you uh, go through that. So two, a few of our top services include business planning, um, market research, capital access and commercialization, um, which is very relevant to the conversation that we'll be having today. We have 10 regional offices throughout the state of Indiana, as you can see on that map, and uh, over 70 team members that offer those advising services throughout the state. So if you're interested in connecting with us, you can go to our website, which is isbdc.org, or you're welcome to email me directly and I can make the appropriate connections. But now 
I want to turn it over to Andrew Carty, who is the Economic Development Division Director of the Indiana State Department of Agriculture. We are very fortunate to have a wonderful relationship with ISDA, and we're really happy for them to be here today. Thanks, Morgan, and thanks very, very much for setting all this up, and thanks to everybody for joining today. Um, obviously, Indiana is very well positioned. We've got so many innovative things happening in our ecosystem and all the work that everyone on the call is doing, all the work that our partners are doing and in these really creative spaces. I'm really excited uh, that we're having this conversation because SBIR is a longstanding program. Uh, it's a resource program with dollars that has multi-year trajectories to help companies do creative things and really take it to the next level. Uh, and just being able to link up with resources, I hope that every single person that's interested, that's on today, that's listening, you know, really, really do reach out to the SBDC, really, really do reach out to the Elevate folks, reach out to me, reach out to um, Melissa, who were very, very, or Melinda, who were very, very fortunate to have on here today, um, to ask questions, to get deeper involved and, and more educated on this program, because it's a really great asset that I think we in Indiana could take a lot more advantage of. Uh, and I do I, I do want to thank you, Melinda, for being here. I know you're taking time out of your day from USDA to kind of go through this this program, talk people through, you know, what the topics of interest are, which a lot of them uh, are ag related, uh, what the application process, all those high level components uh, that someone would need to know to dive in here. Uh, it's really critical to have your boots on the ground, expertise and willingness to sit and kind of have that dialogue. Morgan mentioned afterwards if we have questions. Uh, which I'm happy to plug in on as well. Uh, but I did just want to say one last thing, and that's the SBDC is absolutely going to be your number one resource for this program. Morgan really undersold uh, the, the group, I think. It's very near and dear to my heart, and I think it's just a phenomenal program we have across Indiana. Got about 70 advisors that are available to sit down one-on-one, -on -one, doesn't cost anything, to help you navigate these programs and be successful. Uh, going after this stuff and uh, I think it would be uh, an error if you're interested in this program and going after this program uh, not to be working with your SBDC to try to put in an application be competitive and think through that so definitely definitely uh, if you're interested be connecting with your SBDC folks but very excited that this is happening I'm going to learn something I'm going to sit here and listen and I know Melinda's going to teach me something today so that makes me happy uh, and I'll be looking forward to kind of questions at the end. So thanks, Morgan. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, Andrew. You, Andrew. I, really I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be here. I know, um, you know you have great relationships with our, our agribusinesses in the state. So I think the coordination between economic development and ag and now USDA um, just really speaks to the ecosystem that we've developed in Indiana. And I'm really happy to see this coordination and collaboration. So without further ado, um, I am going to turn it over to Melinda Kaufman. Um, Melinda is the SBIR Program Coordinator at USDA and the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Um, Melinda is an expert, so take advantage um, of her time. Be sure to ask questions. Let's discuss when we get to that, uh, that Q&A at the end. Um, but Melinda, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Morgan, and thank you, Andrew. And I just want to say I'm happy to be here. And um, uh, one little caveat I want to say is that I'm relatively new in this program, so I don't know if I quite qualify as an expert, Morgan, <laughs> but I'll do my best. If I don't, if you have a question and I don't know the answer to it, we'll, um, I'll have you email me and I will get back with you. I'm good at doing that. So, We're all then, underselling ourselves today. <laughs> and I just wanted to um, emphasize what Andrew said. Um, the, we really want people to apply. We're really interested in doing that. And um, the SBDCs are great ways to get some help. There's, I mean, you know, why not? I think um, that's a really good thing to do. And so I hope any of you that have some, you know, innovations or a project that you think fits with SBIR, um, you know, I would just encourage you to check them out at least. So, um, okay, so again, I'm Melinda Kaufman. I'm the USDA SBIR program coordinator. I'm very happy to be here at the Indiana Small Business Development Center. Next slide. Um, 
I'd just like to start with kind of an overview of our broad goals, kind of gives you a basis um, to um, go from for the rest of the presentation. So we want to meet federal research and development needs by stimulating both scientific and technological innovation. Um, we also want to increase private sector commercialization of innovation derived from federal research and development funding. We um, also very importantly want to foster and encourage participation in innovation and entrepreneurship by women and socially and, and or economically disadvantaged individuals. Some features of the USDSBIR program include that these ideas are investigator initiated. So this is, you know, small businesses with um, PIs and uh, PDs that have um, innovations or projects um, that they want to set forward. And um, the awards are based on both the technical and the scientific merit. Also, the PI and the company qualifications and the commercialization potential of the innovation. So all three of those things are very important together. Um, subcontracting to universities and USDA labs is permitted and encouraged. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. Um, so some of the success metrics from receiving an SBIR grant include it increases the number of new jobs created in the country, and it increases the sales of technology and services developed, and um, also sales to other businesses of licenses to the technology that your company has developed. Um, a little bit about our budget. Um, so our annual budget is around 29 million. Um, for FY21, as an example, our phase one was eight months in length and $100,000. Phase two was two years in length and $600,000. Um, and in phase one for FY19 had a 14.8% award rate. That was 79 out of 533 applications. And for uh, FY20, it was a 16.1 award rate. So I'm, um, it is competitive. It is very competitive. Um, so that was 70 out of 435 applications. For phase two, um, it's, it's not, it, there's a more, higher success rate for the awards. Um, so it was a, for FY19 was a 40.6% success rate, 26 out of 64 applications. And FY20 was 42.6, which was 29 out of 68. And um, I think I mentioned it later, but I do want to just emphasize right here that there is unfortunately no direct to phase two. You have to win a phase one award first uh, to be eligible to apply for phase two. So um, we have we offer uh, TABA or TABA, however you like to pronounce it, which is technical and business assistance. Um, it was first introduced as part of the John S. McCain National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2019. And TABA um, can include things like um, marketing research, help with marketing, financial review, IP legal costs, intellectual property legal costs, um, consults on funding strategies or activities related to manufacturing, and much more. That's just a sampling of what TABA can do. Again, it's a, um, uh, as you'll see as I continue talking about this, it is uh, actually free in its assistance. Um, so I really encourage people, any kind of free assistance you can get, um, you know, again, why not? So uh, for phase one, it's $6,500 um, beyond your budget. So if you have hundred thousand. If you meet like the maximum a hundred thousand dollar budget, then and you ask for TABA um, funds, then it'll be one hundred thousand six hundred one hundred six thousand five hundred dollars. Um, and that um, so sixty five hundred is just free to you. 
Same thing with phase two. You request it, you get $50,000. So if your budget is $600,000, you get $650,000 if you request HABA. Um, so that helps to move you towards um, the commercial market. SBI are topic areas. So um, just to get an idea um, a little bit more about what the actual um, uh, science behind it is, is um, we have these 10 topic areas. We have forest and related resources. We have two for plant protection and production. 8.2 is the biology wing of that. And then 8.13 is the plant um, is the engineering part of plant production and protection. Then we have animal production and protection. We have conservation of natural resources. 8.5 is food science and nutrition. Rural and community development. 8.7 is aquaculture. 8.8 .8 is biofuels and bio-based products. And 8.12 is small and mid-sized farms. Now you probably noticed that rural and community development, 8.6, and small and mid-sized farms, 8.12. Those are um, in red font because they're just a little bit different. You can have you know, an innovation for those two, but they also accept existing technologies um, that are used in an innovative way. Um, so uh, you can have an off-the-shelf technology as long as you have a new application of it in those two topic areas. And then we have this slide in here just to make sure that people know that agriculture, um, you know, does have a lot of science behind it. And so we, this is again, not a comprehensive list, but you know, there are people out there who are surprised to know that agriculture utilizes, you know, like nanotechnology and um, memes and robotics and remote sensing acoustics machine vision, biofuels, it's, um, uh, and again, I just want to emphasize this is not an all-inclusive list. Anything, um, anything scientific can have a potential um, application to agriculture. Here is um, our timeline. This is our typical timeline um, for phase one and phase two. So this year, we hope that the um, typically and we hope that the um, RFA for phase one will be released in July. We're thinking it might be mid-July. So um, we don't have complete control over that. You might have guessed that by the way I uh, <laughs> prefaced that, but that's what we're shooting for. So July um, and then the proposal deadline is um, October and this year we're thinking it'll be early October. Um, the panels will take place in January of 22 and then the awards will be issued June through August of 22. For phase two, which again is only open to phase one awardees and no straight to phase two, um, typically the RFA is released in December, so we're hoping for December of this year. And the proposal deadline is um, February or March, late February, early March of 22. The panels are in uh, July of 22, notifications in August, and awards in November of 22. Um, the review process, we'll talk a little bit about what happens once you submit your proposals. So, um, before we go to panel, there's an, an administrative review. And so that just means that you have followed all the guidelines and the RFA and that you haven't, you know, if there's a, I think it's an 18 page um, limit on the narrative for your proposal that you haven't written 40 pages. That will, uh, you know, please don't do that. Please follow the guidelines in there because that knocks you out right from the very beginning, right? You know, we do the, that's the first thing we do after the, um, the RFA closes, then um, we do the administrative review and it just has to be in line with what the R RFA um, allows. Um, so once the administrative review is done, then we move to the panels 
And the proposals are evaluated by this con confidential peer review panel that is made up of experts from across the country. Um, they come from nonprofits, academia, federal labs, and industry. And it's a mix of um, all those people. Um, so, and there's a, a panel manager who um, runs the panel, and that's um, outside of um, the USDA. Um, so we try to be as objective and fair as possible uh, with that mix of people. Um, we also use ad hoc reviewers for both phase one and phase two. And then um, every applicant will receive a verbatim copy of the review that the panel does. Um, since going back a couple of slides, you'll remember that there's a 15% success rate. Um, realistically, a lot of people do not make it the first time. So you would, if you were one of those, hopefully you won't be, but if you were one of those, then you would have those comments from the panel of experts um, that will guide you in making your proposal stronger. And then you can resubmit at the next um, cycle. Um, and again, phase two applicants are only able to apply. Well, I guess we haven't talked about that. Phase two applicants are only able to apply once. So if you receive a phase one and um, you have two years to apply, and if you feel like you're not quite ready, um, that you're you're you know you're not at a point in in the development of your innovation that you want to apply, then you can wait another year to apply. You can get an extension. Um, so university and government scientists involvement in USDA SBIR program, we strongly encourage this. Um, and I, I know it seems a little heavy, um, but you know, you can always contact me and we can go over this more if you need, if you find yourself in this situation. But scientists can serve as consultants or receive a subcontract and continue to work full time at their home institution. Now, they're limited to no more than one third of the phase one award or one half of the phase two award. They, um, scientists can also serve as the principal investigator on an SBIR grant, but they have to reduce their employment at their home institution to 49% or less for the duration of the grant. Um, and the SBIR research has to be performed someplace other than their research lab. Um, it's usually not acceptable for university or government scientists to serve as consultants and have all the research done in their labs. So that's the reason we have this in there twice is because it's kind of important. And so, you know, plan accordingly. Um, and then um, developing a cooperative research and development agreement with a USD lab, USDA lab or license. USD innovation um, is also an option for you, and we'll talk more about that. So that cooperative research and development agreement is called a CRADA, and um, it is an additional factor that will be considered in the review process to include uh, whether a phase one or phase two application involves a CRADA with a USD laboratory or a license to a USDA technology. So, in the event that two or more applications are of approximately equal value, um, the existence of a crater with a USD lab or a license to a USD technology will be an important consideration. And um, the other thing about craters is that um, you can, you know, you get a lot of help from that. We have you have USD scientists that will be helping you, you know, to develop your innovation. And if that is something of interest to you, you can contact me and I can put you in contact um, with the person who would um, kind of be the, the first point of contact in the Agricultural Research Service and can help you uh, find a good fit. Here are some factors that can improve your chances of award success. Having that high technical or scientific merit is very important along with the commercial attend the commercial potential those are really important things to have and um, we 
do not shy away from projects that are high risk and high reward. So we encourage those. Um, and then having good consultants is always a, you know, an advantage as long and also with the credit agreements that we just spoke about. Having some business expertise on your team is important. And then letters of support, having strong letters of support um, is a big advantage from phase three partners, from your customers, your end users, um, and your investors. Um, so those letters of support should be addressed to you. Um, sometimes people address them to us and that's not what we want. We want them addressed to you and then um, share them with us as part of your application process. Um, and having a clear understanding of the entry and sustainability in the market and conveying that. Um, in your proposal. Um, more advice for your phase one proposal. Um, at the beginning of your phase one proposal, it's really good if you can spend some time developing a vision of where you see your innovation being at the end of phase two. Because if you're applying for a phase one, you probably are going to be applying for a phase two also. And so um, having that vision is really quite important. Um, so to spend some time developing that and talking about the market opportunity. Um, I focus the phase one research on critical enabling factors for your innovation. So the importance of your project and the alignment with USDA priorities. Um, provide a detailed experimental plan and include proprietary information provide insight into the commercial potential and show the connectivity with the communities you're intending to serve by including those letters of support to you know, end users, investors, et cetera. More advice for phase one, <laughs> get your registrations completed early. And this is so important. Um, so in addition to these sam.gov, grants.gov, sbir.gov, there's a DUNS number that you'll need to get. Um, and I believe it is the SAM.gov that can take a little time. And we actually last year had um, someone who had their proposal already ready to go near the deadline and didn't get their SAM.gov back in time. So they were not able to apply. And unfortunately, I don't think that's unusual. So I can't emphasize that enough. Just go ahead and do that and get that under, you know, get that done. Um, and then contact the national program leader for a consult or the topic area leader. Um, the national program leader um, is, uh, as you look through the RFA once it's published, you'll see every topic area and listed in the topic area is the national program leader. And what I suggest is that you write up a very informal, very brief summary of your innovation of your project. Um, so make it make one or two paragraphs in an email and send it to that national program leader and request a consult. That way, the national program leader has time to review, uh, get a sense of what your project is, and will be better prepared to talk with you about it. You can also just pick up the phone and call them, but I highly suggest you know you give them a little advance notice and give them a little you know preview of what you're going to plan to do. And then um, the next bullet: follow all application guidelines for format, page limits, required documents. Read the RFA. So. <laughs> You know, it is fine to contact me or our program specialist, Kelly McDonald, and that will be at the end, um, that information. But most of the time, the questions you have are in the R You can get answered immediately by looking at the RFA. I mean, we try to answer you pretty fast, too, but it really is easier if you just download a copy of the RFA and make it searchable, um, then you can usually get those answered. But I'm not saying that to discourage you from contacting us. We're glad to hear from you, but I'm just saying that usually you can find the answer there and it's easier. Um, and um, again, apply, apply early. 
So some success stories for uh, SBIR at the USDA. I'd like to cover some of these with you. Alteros Energies, um, Alteros Buoyant Airborne Turbine, or BAT, we'll call it BAT, leverages proven aerospace technology to lift the wind turbine into the strong, consistent winds of beyond the reach of traditional wind turbines. Um, economic power generation for rural communities and remote locations. They've had commercialization success. They were featured in CNN's 2014 edition of the CNN 10 and in the New York Times. And the telecoms group SoftBank has invested $7 million in Alteros Energies for future deployment of this BAT technology in Japan. Prairie Aquatac. They have a natural process to convert soybean meal to fish feed using microbial enhancement. It's called MePro, and they've had commercialization success in the form of um, they received the 2019 Aquafeed Innovation Award in Cologne, Germany, and they commissioned a 30,000 square foot facility in the summer of 2019 so they could scale up their production. And they've sold samples or sent uh, samples to manufacturers in at least 12 countries. And they should have new products coming to market this year. Embrex. Embrex developed a higher throughput and superior technology for OVO vaccination. Technology provided benefits to enhance the efficiency and bird performance. Their commercialization success has been pretty impressive. They, in 2001, they had uh, $44 million in revenues and it, they had increased in employees from less than 10 to over 200 and they were purchased by Pfizer. So again, I'm Melinda Kaufman, I'm the SBIR program coordinator and Kelly McDonald is our very knowledgeable SBIR program specialist. You can contact um, me by just putting a dot in between Melinda and Kaufman and then using at USDA.gov. Um, or you can just contact SBIR at USDA.gov and Kelly or I will get back to you that way. Over um, on the left hand side of the screen is um, our web page and I encourage you um, to go there and look around. There's a lot of answers there too. Thank you very much. And um, let me know if I can help in any way. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Melinda. We really, really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to be here with us. I hope it was helpful. And we have a few questions in the chat. We'll save them to the end, but okay. uh, we should have some good discussion. So moving on, I think I saw our next speaker join us. Um, Lisa, are you there? I am. Perfect. Well, I'd love to introduce Dr. Lisa Hoverman. Uh, Dr. Hoverman uh, works for the state of Indiana and Elevate Ventures to offer SBIRS TTR support uh, programming. So Dr. Hoverman, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Awesome. Thanks for having me today. I will say that um, we really enjoy working with the USDA and the USDA SBI RFS. We have a lot of awards in Indiana um, and some really great success stories through that. So if you're ever looking to apply to the SB, uh, SBIR program through the USDA and you want to connect with someone who's done it, uh, we have a lot of good case studies in Indiana. So um, please reach out to me. So just a little bit about what we offer in the state of Indiana. Uh, we offer full support around the SBIR STTR life cycle. So if you're just learning about SBIR or you're on your 15th and you need help in phase two, we help out. So depending on where you're at, we can step in and help you. And I'll just sort of cover some of the things that we offer um, from the state perspective. So we offer things like um, helping you understand the program. We introduce you to it. We come in and understand what technology, where you're at with your company, if you're just starting out, if you just have a great idea, or if you're maybe on your second prototype. We help you fully understand uh, where your fit might be with the program and how that will work out best um, for you, for your company, and for the stage that you're at. 
And so sometimes that's going for an SBIR phase one with USDA. Sometimes that's going for a direct to phase two with NIH, uh, sort of depending on where you are. Since today's focus is on USDA SBIR, I will say our services around that usually focus on the traditional path and helping companies understand how they go phase one, successfully do that, and then complete phase two. And we help out with things like talking to the program officers if you need that, templates, um, sample proposals, both from the agency and some that other people have allowed us to redact from the state and then share with other entrepreneurs. Um, we help you with outlines, getting started. One of the biggest things that we offer that is helpful is we offer reviews as you're writing your SBIR grant. And we sort of offer, I would say, one-on-one -on -one coaching or counseling throughout that process to get you to a really well-written response and to help you get that submitted. Um, other things that we offer in terms of SBIR, SPTR support is we're really well connected with the universities throughout the state. So depending on where you're at, you can pretty easily reach out to a university in Evansville or a university in the Fort Wayne area or in the South Bend area or West Lafayette or Lafayette to help you connect with the right lab space, the right subject matter expert in a certain field to help you take your proposal or your idea further. So we offer services sort of comprehensively around that. The great thing about the Elevate Venture Services are for any Indiana-based company, they are completely free to you and your company. And we engage really as much as you want us to engage. So for each SBIR, we offer up to about four hours of review alone on your written grant. That usually gets you about three reviews if you do it properly and according to our schedule. But we offer, um, services around that in terms of topic identification, getting you to the right place, and a myriad of other services before you start writing before that that are really built to make the entrepreneur successful. In addition to that, once you actually win a phase one grant, and we are working really hard with you alongside you to make sure you're successful for that, Indiana is one of the only states that has a non-competitive automatic match program on our phase one. So as long as you win a phase one grant award and you submit the proper documentation to elevate, that phase one award is automatically matched 50 cents on the dollar through our state program up to $100,000. So that can be up to an additional $50,000 for your project. That's very um, important and a really nice thing for our entrepreneurs because if you are participating in the SBIR program and you've learned a little bit about it, as you know, those dollars are limited that you win from the federal government for research and development. The additional $50,000 from the state can be used on your project in any way you want, as long as it's tied to your project. So if you need to pay for perhaps patent fees, if you need to perhaps pay for some marketing, those are dollars you can use in that way that you can't use the R&D dollars for traditionally on a straight phase one. So those are a really high level view of the services we offer. And um, I will say that I primarily support and lead this from Elevate Ventures, along with a colleague of mine, Dr. Carl Kohler. I don't think he's on today, but either of us is accessible um, through the Elevate Apply and Entrepreneurs link. And you can reach us um, by asking for topic identification or SBIR help on the website. And if you haven't filled out or don't have an SBIR ready to go, that's okay. Just state that on the form and just look for SBI topic identification or help and you can reach us. And that's really through elevateventures.com forward slash apply. Um, and I think Morgan has my email address and I don't see it up there, but um, she can share it with everyone that's attending after the call. And if you reach out directly to me, we can point you in the right directions, get you started on the path so that you get access to and can take advantage of the free Indiana resources available to you. And in case you've won an SBIR and haven't had the match, please reach out right away so we can get that process started for you so you can qualify and obtain that match that so comes automatic from the state. Most other states are competitive, Indiana is not, and that's a huge benefit and gives our entrepreneurs a little bit more runway to be successful. So Morgan, I'll stop there. Is there anything else you'd like me to cover or any questions I can answer that maybe have popped up in the chat? No, I think you covered everything. I really appreciate your time today. Um, we have a question in the chat for Melinda, so I'll go ahead and ask that and then let's see if some questions come in for Dr. Hoverman. Um, so Melinda, someone said, asked, um, are there any future considerations to increase the phase two amount to one million um, like some other agencies? 
Well, we would love that. Um, but um, I'm not aware of anything going up that high. Um, you know, every year we ha it's um, I'm not sure how to say this succinctly, so it's not just real tedious, but um, our budget is based kind of on a tax that we tax um, other agencies within the USDA. And so it just depends on a lot of agencies budgets and that's how we form our budget. So, um, you know, we are always hopeful that the award amounts will increase, um, but we only have so much control over that. Um, but we're always welcoming of it, of course, um, if that helps. I wish I could give you a more definitive answer. I will say that we're actually um, kind of in the middle of all the SBIR um, award amounts. So, um, uh, you know, we're we're kind of at the top of the smaller SBIRs um, or at the bottom of the larger ones, whichever way you want to look at it. So, we're, but we're right there kind of in the middle as far as award amounts go. Perfect. Thank you, Melinda. And Anne says thank you as well. Uh, so we have another question that I think you both could speak to. Um, and please do make sure that you're on mute so I'm not getting feedback. OK, um, I think this is a question both of you could speak to. They said they had a question about the scientific part of phase one. Should the proposed activities be general in nature? I said it seems like a year is a long time to apply and then wait for funds before starting the work. Their small business has to move fast and they can't wait for a year to do critical work. But at the same time, it feels like if they were to apply for a less important project, it would be less likely to be funded. Do you have any advice? Um, I, I guess. I'm not sure exactly how to interpret a, a less important project. I mean, um, I would, if your project fulfills, you know, a purpose um, and fulfills a gap um, that isn't a, for something that doesn't exist, currently exist, then I would call it important. And what I would suggest is that um, you go ahead and do that, what I was talking about, write up a summary, you know, it, informal, don't spend a lot of time on it, just an informal summary. Um, identify which national program leader, which topic area you think your um, um, project fits into the best and um, send it to them and request a consult. It's not too early now to do that. So um, that's what I would suggest you do. And they'll be able to give you the most, um, the most, the best advice around the scientific portion of it. Does that help, Kyle? And Morgan, I can add to that. I would say that a lot of our entrepreneurs have platform technologies, and you, as you're moving fast, keep doing that. But write up some of your maybe slightly beyond the reach of what your lowest hanging fruit is if you know that you're moving on your lowest hanging fruit, but write up the next thing that you would do and get that in, talk to the program managers about that, but also maybe write it in a way so that your lowest hanging fruit could be incorporated as well. Because we all know as entrepreneurs, as we get into something and we're working on a project and we're working on R&D, we ha sometimes have to pivot and things change really quickly. What we might have written up two weeks ago has suddenly changed. And I think it's worth thinking about that and leaving rooms in your write up for that to to pivot and change. And in SBIR phase one, I will say our the program managers are very used to our entrepreneurs who are moving fast, having to pivot and change um, on what they've written and what they've proposed because of the work that they've done, maybe in the interim of waiting for funding, or even once the funding has come in and they've started because they've learned something from what they've done. So that's not unusual. So I say still apply, still write that up. And once you have that initial writing down, that's often the biggest hurdle I see for our entrepreneurs. You can then quickly tweak the writing if it's a really well written document, because you have a platform technology, you can then speak to as you've pivoted and update that application or go back to your program manager and say, this is how we've had to pivot and give them a report 
in the change in direction in funding. So it can be used whether you have one or before you actually are awarded. And I would say that shouldn't be a hindrance to you applying. Perfect. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. And Kyle said, thank you. So I think we we addressed the question there. Um, while I wait on some more questions to come in, I'm going to to ask something that we don't we don't seem to talk about um, when we're talking about how to apply for for any SBI or STTR program, and that's the the what happens if you receive an award. Um, you know, I feel like a lot of small businesses aren't really set up to to meet the the reporting obligations and the financial tracking obligations that come with an SBI or STTR award. Um, so could either of you provide like the the high level overview of what those expectations would be? Lisa, do you want to go first? I went first last time. I guess I just kind of jumped in there. So it's sure, no problem. <laughs> I'll, I'll speak from the state view of sort of of the outside, and then I'll let you speak to the inside view from the agency. So from the outside view, we always recommend and we make specific recommendations if people are asking for them that you have an accountant in place to help you. So that for the financial um, tracking obligations and what you'll need to put back into reports, be that the report system for USDA, unless you guys have changed the name or a different system for a different agency, we have SBIR specific and trained accountants in Indiana that we can recommend to people, but any accountant will be able to, if you give them the instructions, help you meet those reporting requirements. I will also say that for all of them, they are set up for small businesses to be able to do them on their own. And so carefully reading and going through them slowly and on time, giving yourself time to do it, you can do it yourself. But we strongly recommend you have an accountant to help you. And very often there's funding now built into the phase one mechanisms and even suggestion in the budget budgets to help you get accounting help. So that's number one for the financial obligations. And so once you have that accountant in place, sharing with them the reporting requirements once you receive an award, either giving them access to the reporting system or printing off the documentation or going through it with them is a best practice. And it depends on the agency with how you do that. So that's the accounting piece. I would say that the other contractual requirements piece and reporting piece are actually a lot less strenuous and um, I would say overbearing than perhaps some people think. It is the federal government sort of like taxes, you do have to do it, you do have to report, you do have to do things. But as long as you give yourself time, you read through it and you know what's expected and when it's expected, it's usually something pretty comprehensively that you can do and easily do. So for USDA phase one, and um, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I believe it's just a final report that you give them at the end of your phase one. That could depend on the timing. And if you extend your phase one, then you may have an interim report or different reports do, depending on what you choose. But if you have a six month phase one, it's usually just a final report. If it's longer or you extend it to two years, then there are additional reporting requirements, but those are pretty well spelled out. And there's, we have outlines and templates to help you do those. And we can also help you understand if you let us know you've done an extension, when you can report on those. And they tend to be pretty straightforward, speaking to your technical objectives or your science or research objectives, talking to each of those and how you've accomplished them or had to pivot on them or what hasn't worked or what has worked. So they're they're pretty straightforward. If you have commercial outcomes, you report on those. A lot of the systems have um, forms that you actually fill out online that sort of do the report for, for you and others ask you for a Word document that you upload. Again, that's sort of agency dependent. But I would say, again, all of these are built for small businesses to do. And with the state aid next to you, if you ask for it, pretty easily done and something I feel a small business can do as long as you're planning and aware of them. Um, that I think that advice that Lisa gave about an accountant is very good um, and um, I hope you all will follow that. Um, as far as reporting goes, I think you know there's there are SBIR programs across the government. Uh, across, across the federal government, but for USDA, um, for phase one and phase two, we do have three reports. Um, so there is an interim report that's, you know, there isn't a real strict deadline because um, we want to be flexible for the scientific pro 
um, process. So it's around the middle of your project, um, an interim report, and there's you know guidance about how to do those. And then you'll have a final technical report. So both the interim report and the final technical report will include proprietary information, but then you'll have the report, which is um, basically the final report with uh, the um, uh, uh, proprietary information um, removed from it. And because that goes into a system that um, can be accessed by the public. So um, those are really important distinctions um, to keep in mind. That's great. Thank you both. And the Indiana SBDC is a, a federally funded grant program. So just to reiterate, read, 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 and give yourself time. Um, because if you, you read the materials provided, they typically outline um, pretty plainly what, what your requirements are, um, but you're only going to know them if you take the time to read it. So. Uh, read, 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 and give yourself time. We've had three questions come in. Um, so first question is, after we've submitted a pro proposal, can we go ahead and begin work on the project, even if we don't know if we won the award? So essentially, can we use the SBIR grant to reimburse for expenses incurred after the deadline, but before you received the grant? Um, this is a question from Kelly, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Kelly, I do not believe you can do that, but I have to say I'm not 100% sure. I haven't run into this particular question before, um, but what I'd like you to do is to email me, and again, it's melinda.kaufman at usda.gov, and I'll research that a little bit more, but I don't believe you can reimburse costs. Um, should I go on to the PI question? Oh, or? yeah, that's perfect. Let me go ahead and read it. Sorry, I was typing your email in the chat, so they had it. Uh, so the next question is, um, the PI must not be employed more than 49% at another company. So is there also an hour specification like other departments, or is it a flat 49%? Uh, the 49% um, is based on a full-time, is uh, based on full-time work. Um, so. In other words, um, we just um, don't want people split between too many things. So, um, so 49 or less percent of a 40 hour work week. Perfect. Thank you. Next question. Um, this might be for Dr. Hoverman. I don't think I quite understand the question, so hopefully we can tag team it here. Um, is the state of Indiana willing to reference studies that they themselves have done in the past as part of a submission to gain inclusion in this program? Um, Indiana SBDC did a study on a previous iteration of my product offering and deemed it as very viable. Again, I don't think I understand the question. Yeah, Morgan, I'm not sure I fully know. Do you want, uh, this is David, if you want me to explain it. Yeah, go ahead, David. So I had a product that I'd worked on in the past and had uh, been based uh, up in Anderson, Indiana, and the ISBDC came in and and, and took a look at it and uh, did a review of the whether or not the product even um, would fit into industry. Uh, at the time um, <clears throat> we did it, we, we categorized the product as a cleaning agent is in, and it is now it. Uh, evolved into a disinfectant um, that's for both hospital and uh, all the way through home use. And I have a copy of that ISBDC study that looked at not only, you know, everything under the sun, whether it was um, what's the dollar value in the industry of, of products like this to how much it would bring revenue wise into the state to how many jobs we could include, et cetera. As I apply for this, um, um, inclusion into your, into the program. I'm wondering if I could um, send a copy of that study, if it would enhance my ability to get traction at the level you were discussing before, which is, um, you know, what is important was, you know, I heard the USDA representative mention uh, the speed at which people get response. You know, is this something that we need to have right now, or is this something that it's going to take a year to get through? So I just didn't know if that helped me to get get faster traction. So 
So I, if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, you're asking um, would a, a report um, showing that your, your product is viable and will bring value to the state of Indiana um, help increase your response rate or competitiveness for, for the SBIR award, is that correct? That is exactly what I was asking, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not um, familiar with that that study. Um, that's not something that the SBDC typically does. We're not here to say if you have a good or bad idea. We're just here to help you be successful in our best way possible. Um, so, Dr. Hoberman, I don't know if um, that's something that you're more familiar with. I would say that you know somebody giving an independent assessment of your product you're offering, um, and it being a positive one is never going to hurt you. Um, the way that review processes work for most of the agencies is that that's something that they might might consider, but it probably wouldn't change their review process too much. But again, I think if it's positive, it's not something that would hurt you. I don't think it would accelerate the timeline at all. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, so if you have any more, start furiously typing uh, before we start to wrap up. Um, Andrew Cardi, if you're still on, do you have any any questions um, from the ag perspective? Uh, you're on mute. You think at this point in time, I would be better than that. Uh, it's been a no, year and a half. <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's a really great discussion. I'm glad that everybody was able to join and thanks to Melinda and thanks to Lisa for providing all this information. Uh, my only question and my only kind of statement that I would say is, you know, there's all these resource provision uh, opportunities out there and priorities. Um, my question to Melinda would be, you know, the prioritization for the program, you know, how frequently does it change? What's it going to look like? I guess the scuttle, but for maybe what what the next cycle would be uh, and then my only other statement would be for any of any of the folks out there trying to navigate you know i want to do this but i'm a little overwhelmed um, i'll always offer myself up as a a point of contact if you need just one person to call that can help you kind of navigate through this and and kind of maximize your ecosystem steps one two and three i'm happy to do that but melinda that was the only thing that kind of popped up on my mind uh, kind of listening to stuff so uh, likely changes in the RFA are, are basically. Well, I think there's that prioritization uh, component. Uh, you know, I think it was there's a few different agricultural components, forestry, that kind of stuff, uh, which I really like to see. I don't know if those kind of priority targets change year to year oh. uh, or not. And if they do, you know, do you have any rumblings of what next year might be looking like? You know, they really don't change that much from year to year. I mean, they're pr we purposely keep the topic areas fairly broad. So as an applicant, it's not uncommon that your innovation will fit into more than one topic area. And um, that's where you can get help from usually the national program leader for the topic area um, in and you know, just choose the one you think might be the best fit, and they can usually guide you if they think you're a better fit for a different topic area. And then, um, so we keep them broad um, so that we don't have to change them a lot, and so that we can capture innovations. I mean, we, you know, that's what this program about is about in is innovation, and so we don't want to restrict, um, you know, the the fundamentals of that. Um, this year, I think the biggest change um, will probably, in the topic areas, will probably be just that addition of some climate change language. Um, it's mm -hmm. not that um, it was something that wasn't allowed before. It, these are things that are allowed before. We're just making it more explicit. Um, so I think that you'll find that that's the biggest change. That's really helpful. Thank you. Good. Good. Wonderful. Thank you, Melinda. Well, I, I don't see any additional questions in the chat, so I'll go ahead and, and call it here. Um, thank you all for your time today. Like I said, you will receive a copy of the, the recording, um, the slides that I can make available, and also some additional resources. That's a good tool to have in your tool belt. Um, so be on the lookout for an email 
from for an email from me. Goodness gracious, word soup. Um, an email from me next week with all of those resources. And you know, we're we're your team. Um, we are here in your corner to help you succeed, but you just have to ask. Um, so please do utilize the resources that are available um, and reach out if you have any questions. Thank you all so much, and I have, hope you have a great weekend. And thank you to our thank speakers. You. Thank you. Good luck to everyone. <laughs>